Hello and welcome back to Growing Revenue Through Direct Bookings. My name is Brian and today I'll be covering part six, which is uncovering opportunities on your website to drive more direct bookings. Your website's a, an important channel in your marketing mix with a lot of people researching on your website before they make a decision. And then a lot of people, in fact, usually the majority of people booking on your website as well. The upside is huge. You can see here, you can run your own numbers, how much more money you could make um, if you just had a, a slight improvement in your conversion rate. In this case, just 15% um, could increase your annual revenue by $300,000. So this is uh, really compelling. Plug in the numbers yourself, figure out what your potential annual revenue increase is, and you can see why it's important to spend some time on this. We're gonna be covering this in two parts today quantitative assessment to find out what's happening and qualitative to find out why it's happening. Before you dive in, you need to make sure that you can trust your data. Bad data can waste your time, but it can also lead you to make bad decisions, which is even worse. This requires some technical configuration, such as uh, setting up cross-domain tracking, for example. This picture shows an example of a cross-domain tracking problem where a lot of the revenue is, is um, assigned to the direct channel, even though this is not actually true. And that's obviously very disruptive to analytics work. But it goes beyond the technical setup as well. You need to understand the history of your data uh, to make sure that you don't end up with false positives or false negatives. For example, um, I found I, I was working on a client recently where they had a huge amount of traffic in August 2019, and it looked like our traffic had declined a lot in 2022. What was the reason for that? Well, it turns out that he had a huge influx of worthless uh, Google uh, paid traffic in 2019. Maybe somebody was playing around with something. It just happened over a couple of day period. It looks like um, somebody was testing out something on advertising that ended up not working out. And so understanding your data, knowing some of your data history will be important to make sure that you don't get led down the wrong path. You also need to understand your uh, traffic mix since not all channels convert at the same level. For example, banner ads on Facebook and Google, especially with discovery campaigns, convert lower than something, say, like paid search. With this client, we're using an extremely aggressive uh, advertising strategy with 42% of the traffic coming from display ads. It's working out tremendously well for them, but it does make it look like their conversion rate is low. And if we were to pull out that display traffic, we can see that their conversion rate across the entire website without that is actually 2.7%. So it's important to know um, what your traffic mix looks like. If you get a lot of traffic to your blog, like this company does, be sure not to look at your overall conversion rate, but rather the conversion rate of just the, your non-blog traffic. In this case, it looks like his conversion rate is terrible at 1.2%, but once you exclude the blog traffic, it's 37 So again, just be aware of the fact that you have some, you might have some pages and some channels that aren't intended to drive direct bookings, at least in uh, one session. And so you have to just be careful when you're interpreting your data. Spam traffic can also be a problem. Take a look uh, at your uh, some of your daily reports, make sure that you don't have an unexpected spike in traffic. If you do, take a look at the traffic for that day, take a look at the source medium reports and find out if you have some traffic that looks obviously like spam. Make sure you're filtering that out before you do your analysis. You also need to be aware of your online versus offline revenue split. If you get a lot of walk-up traffic or a lot of call traffic, you might see a lower website conversion rate um, in that case, your website might be doing its job, but people are converting offline and Google Analytics isn't aware of those conversions. There are other related factors as well, such as how much B2B business you do and whether or not you have those customers book online or just contact you. So knowing your split is important as you're interpreting your conversion rate. With all of that in mind, we can now look at some conversion rate, uh, some target e-commerce conversion rate numbers. We have clients that are both higher and lower than this, but on average, if you pull out content marketing, we see a 3% conversion rate among tours, activities, and attractions in the two to $20 million a year uh, range. Now that we've looked at the targets and some of the caveats that could cause us to be a little high or a little low on those, we can start seeing how we're doing. So let's dive into the quantitative assessment and look at page performance. Now your landing page report is 
a primary report to see where things are good and bad on your website. Now, you will not find conversion rate data on a regular page report. Um, you will only find it on your landing page report. So um, if you have, it, well, and we'll get back to what you can do. You wanna look at um, non-landing pages as well and how those are performing. And we'll get to that in a minute. If you have pages that should be driving calls or form submissions instead of online purchases, set up those as conversions, make sure you're tracking those, and then you would just switch this from e-commerce to whatever goal you're looking for. This is not applicable exclusively to those who have e-commerce transactions on their website. Um, this client is an example of a company with content marketing. So we're seeing a lot of uh, content marketing pages mixed in here. So in this case, we already had a, a content group built, so I clicked on tour, However, you can filter out your blog traffic, you can filter it out so that you're looking just at uh, those commercial intent pages that you have on your site. And then we need to start looking through page by page to see if we see any opportunities. This top page doesn't allow people to book on our website. This is uh, a partner tour and people book off site. So the fact that that has a low conversion rate is not a concern. I see a page that's converting unusually high, but I know that this is a seasonal tour it's run by a partner and that partner is sending a lot of traffic to our site. So uh, we know that that tends to convert higher than average. But I do see line six here. This is a seasonal tour and it's currently inactive with no availability. So the fact that it has a conversion rate at all means that people are jumping over to other tours, which is helpful. But at just 0.9%, this means that even though I'm getting a healthy amount of sessions here to this currently inactive tour, a lot of people are not moving forward in that process. So I need to go onto that page and make sure that I have good recommendations that are going to help those people stay on the site and continue to shop for a different tour, even though this one is closed down. Now lines eight and nine are regular tours. So pardon me, lines eight and nine are regular tours, but they're converting lower than I would like, them, like to see them convert. So the next thing I would do here, because there's not a lot of traffic, we're looking at five to 600 sessions per page just four transactions for this particular one, I would probably in this case expand the date range and get myself a higher number of sessions so that I'm looking at statistically significant information. Um, but it could be worth looking at this particular time period if that is a concern. And then from here, whether I expand that date range or not, the normal thing I would do is drill down and find out where the traffic is coming from is a, a high percentage of the traffic coming into this page coming from uh, low converting discovery campaigns? In that case, um, that would make sense. But if even, if even non-paid traffic is converting low, I would start looking at the page itself. Is there maybe a lack of availability, uh, for example? And if so, again, is, there a situation, is this a situation where I should go in and recommend a different tour if we have availability issues? I mentioned that you can get conversion rate data only for landing pages, but if you're looking at only how a page performs as a landing page, you're looking at only part of the picture. Some pages on your site might not get a lot of landing page views, but they're still important pages on the site. So the stats that I'm gonna look at right now are the exit rate and the page value. Now exit rate is the percent of people who exit the site after visiting this page. And page value is an allocation of revenue that, that Google Analytics provides to this page based on its uh, presence in the conversion path. So people visited five pages and ended up uh, making a $100 purchase. Google will assign some value to each page in that conversion path. And that's how you can find out how important a uh, page is to your revenue, even though it might not be a landing page all the time. So let's skim through here and see what we can see. So line eight, is the contact page. So I'm not surprised to see a high exit rate. I would expect that. And I I'm not surprised to see a relatively low page value. No problem there. But line four is interesting. This has a low exit rate and a modest page value. But uh, with a low exit rate, this means that a lot of people are clicking onto other pages. Now I happen to know that this as a landing page doesn't perform all that well. So this is, this is interesting and it might be an indication of what's happening and what, pe what pe uh, people are doing here. So let's take a look. I'm gonna go now to the navigation summary. This report is often overlooked, but it's available for every page on your website in Google Analytics. 
Um, so it's next to this Explorer tab, which is usually selected by default, but you can go to the Navigation Summary, and this tells me where people came from. So 80% of the time that people end up on the page that I'm talking about, I'm gonna call it Experience 4. 80% of the time that people are on, on page Experience 4, they came from another page on the site. It wasn't a landing page view. And then 68% of the time, they are clicking forward to somewhere else on the site, um, and they're not, um, they're not leaving the site. So I can see here that in a huge percentage of the time, people are coming from the home page or one of these three other experiences that we offer. And then um, around, I believe it was around 80% of the time here, 78% of the time, I think it was, um, people are visiting one of the other three experiences after they look at experience four. And then 11% of the time they're going to the homepage. So this is interesting. It looks like they're doing some bouncing back and forth here. They're looking at this particular activity and they're not finding it very compelling or they're confused about how it differs from the other experiences. So um, I might wanna modify the page itself or introduce some sort of a comparison grid to help people directly compare those activities. In addition to pages, it's important to understand how each of our traffic sources is performing. So we can look at the channel report, which I have here on the left. Now in this example, I see a 0.04% conversion rate for display traffic, and that represents 16% of my traffic. Now it's not unusual to see display traffic converting a lot lower than other traffic, um, but this one's particularly low and could require some investigation. I have a theory, and I'm gonna show you on the next page. On the right, I'm looking at the conversion rate by campaign. Um, I see a couple of search campaigns that are performing lower than I expected, and that's information I can feed back to the person managing the ads. Um, the right next step depends on multiple factors. For example, if this is a top of funnel traffic uh, campaign, then this conversion rate actually might be great. So we need to figure out, um, you know, this is where we just have to have a collaborative approach and work with the um, whoever's running the ads and figure out what is this traffic supposed to be doing and is a 1.4% conversion rate a success or not. Now, here's an example of an opportunity. So let's say that I go into one of the, my campaign reports and I see a low converting display campaign. I find out that it's this campaign, this Girl Scouts campaign. Now, in this case, I can see, okay, well, here's a disconnect. I'm, I've, got a, I've got messaging and imagery that specifically tailors to Girl Scouts, and I'm sending it to a, a generic groups page where it says, Adventure Together, we've got just the right thing for all ages and abilities. So if people clicked on this ad expecting to see something about what we offer for Girl Scouts, but they end up on a generic groups page and have to do some work to figure out uh, what is it exactly that you offer for Girl Scouts, then that could explain um, a why the, a conversion rate might not be uh, very good. Now, the information that you saw on this page is not actually related to this page. This is just an example of a situation where we might be able to find um, a conversion rate issue and fix it by something like you know maybe creating more landing pages or uh, doing some personalization here where this information changes dynamically based on uh, the ad that somebody clicked on. We need to look at device type as well. So you can get to this under the audience report and under mobile, you can go to overview. We typically focus on mobile versus desktop. One thing to know here is that mobile traffic can often be comprised of a fair amount of discovery traffic from platforms such as Facebook. So in order to compare apples to apples, I will often pull out display traffic when I'm trying to figure out how is my mobile version of my site comparing to my desktop conversion of my site because I want to compare apples to apples in terms of what it is that people came for and where they came from. Now, just a quick note, we haven't talked a lot about multi-level segmentation and that is something that can be powerful and can be useful. By that I mean you could look at things like what about organic search traffic from California on mobile devices that start on the zipline page? Um, it's possible that you'll find some insights there, but keep in mind that every time you segment, you are making your data set smaller, so you don't want to get too, so little data that the numbers get too volatile. But I did want to point out that multi-level segmentation is possible. It's just not something we're diving into in this video. The mobile versus desktop ratio. If you take your mobile conversion rate and divide it by your desktop conversion rate, on average, 
we see this fall in the 62 to 67 percent range when you divide those two numbers. Why is that important? That means that if your result comes in lower than that, there's a bigger gap between your mobile performance and your desktop performance than average. So that could be an indication that working on your mobile site is a good next step. FAQ tracking is something that you can do if you have accordions like this on your site. Um, you can actually set up, you can have a, um, a technical marketer or a web developer start tracking this for you and send the information directly into Google Analytics as an event. And so we can find out how many people are clicking on each, um, on each question. And then we can use that information in a couple of different ways. One is we can bring that information forward so that people find it before having to click the question. After all, if it's asked that frequently, why are we not answering it more on the front end? And secondly, we might be able to rework the FAQ section to help people find answers more quickly. In one example, on one page, we saw that the fifth most or the, the fifth question in the list was actually the one clicked on the most frequently. And because of that, the next thing that we would want to do is move that question maybe to the top of the list so that people can find their answer faster. Of course, site speed is something that uh, most people know is important to track. And a couple of good ways to track it are uh, Google's PageSpeed Insights tool. Uh, we use often uh, GT Metrics as well. So uh, check your numbers periodically. And if you see anything of concern, make sure that you are discussing that with your web developers. Now we can move into the qualitative assessment, but I'm um, this is this is kind of bridging the gap between quantitative and qualitative scroll and click tracking. Uh, some of this tells you um, uh, kind of quantitative data, and there is some qualitative data that is sometimes bundled in as well. Now, some of the data that's provided, such as what people clicked on, can sometimes be seen in Google Analytics with things like. The, um, the navigation summary report that I showed, but sometimes they can provide richer and easier to use data. These heat maps for clicks are very easy to use and see where people clicked. Um, and in this case, I can also see that people clicked on something that actually isn't a link. So Google Analytics isn't aware that people were clicking this. So um, I had a handful of people click on this uh, location, probably trying to see where this location is relative to where they're staying uh, in Rome. So. In, in this case, I can see that what, you know, one of the insights coming out of this is maybe we need to surface uh, a map here so that if people are wondering, is this close enough to where I'm going to be staying? Can I get there in time? Uh, they don't have to leave the website and go to Google Maps. They can stay here and get their question answered so that we can keep them in that booking flow. Scroll depth heat maps are really uh, useful as well. So for example, I know that social proof is important, but in this particular case, only about one third of the users scrolled down to my testimonials on desktop devices. So I might wanna pick a short quote to include higher on the page so that a higher percentage of users end up seeing at least some of this social proof. If you wanna test out click tracking and scroll depth tracking, I would recommend trying Microsoft Clarity first instead of Hotjar, Microsoft Clarity is free. Um, don't run it on every page at first because it might be it might slow down um, your page load time. I don't have definitive data on that, but it is something to, uh, just to be aware of as a possibility. Look for those why did they click their moments like I just showed you, and then move key information to where people are actually scrolling so that um, you know all of the effort you put into creating that content, if people are never scrolling and seeing it, that's wasted. So you may have to reorganize your pages based on what you find in that study. Um, usability testing is even more powerful. Um, it's an incredibly valuable tool. Platforms like user testing and user feel allow you to watch and hear other people using your website or your competitor's site. Now, user testing is the gold standard here, but it's geared towards large enterprises at this time. So user feel uh, came along and decided to try to make this type of platform available to small and mid-sized businesses. Um, it's not quite as good as user testing, but it um, it, it hits a, an important sweet spot for small and mid-sized businesses. Now, both platforms let you create a, a, uh, a test plan, a series of tasks that testers need to complete, speaking their thoughts out loud as they go. You get to watch the videos when they're complete and create clips and highlight reels and add notes. Um, so Google Analytics is telling you what happened, but this is really where you start seeing, okay, this is why uh, this happened. Now, 
While these studies are highly valuable, they're an investment as well in both time and money. It's best to run a user study of four to six users. Um, that's gonna cost you about $300 with user feel. And then it takes time to watch the videos and compile a report and develop an action plan. So I recommend running um, at least a couple of usability studies per year, more if you can afford the time and money, uh, but they're, um, they, I, every time I've run a usability study, I've come out with good uh, action items. So start with a four to six user study, split the users between desktop and mobile, create a, a loose structure. For example, um, don't just tell people to go onto your website. Maybe sometimes, you know, you get 15 to 20 minutes for these tests. So uh, let a user start where they normally would, such as Google. Tell them uh, you're about to take a trip to Pigeon Forge and you wanna go rafting. Go find a rafting company and, and let them just browse for a little while as part of the task and then watch them. Sit back and watch and listen to what they're saying and what they're discovering. And you're gonna uh, learn a lot about uh, how you're doing competitively um, just, to, just to find people in the first place. Then eventually direct them back to your website. Uh, one of the next tasks would be to visit your website, visit our competitor's site, do some care, compare and contrast, and um, give them as much freedom as you can to see what it is that they do and what it is that they think. And then fourthly, don't overreact to individual experiences. Be, just be, don't be too reactionary. You wanna be responsive to anything that you find that is kind of in common uh, among a couple of users, but um, it's, you just, it takes discipline to not overreact. And then lastly, this last section here, I just want you to think like your customer and run uh, an assessment of your own on your website. Um, this is actually something that you can have friends and family do, but what we need to do is try to overcome the curse of knowledge and then assess whether, uh, or assess your website like a prospective customer would. Now you built a great tour, activity or attraction, and you know everything about it. You know how you're better than the competitor down the road, how great your views are, which of your experiences is best for families, uh, what you wanna be known for, what wonderful things your guests say about you. But the question is, does the website convey that information to someone who knows nothing about you? So let's find out and here's how you can find out. First of all, you assess, would you understand why this company is the best choice? Ignore what you know in your head right now and just go to the website and ask yourself, are you talking about your company or just your category? It's very easy to slip into talking about the category. I'm a zipline company in North Carolina. Uh, we offer zipline tours, come zipping with us. And none of that, that's all categorical. None of it is brand, none of it is company specific, none of it is uh, competitive. It's just categorical, so move beyond the category. Secondly, does my site convey my identity? So you have a certain personality and you wanna make sure that that gets through. That includes some of your value propositions. And can people find your messaging throughout the site? If you look at your landing page, page report, you might find that only 30% of people come in from your homepage. So make sure that that's not the only place that you have put messaging that clearly establishes who you are and why you're great and what your value proposition is. That needs to be available to everybody who comes through to your website. So you can, evaluate how, you just write down, how do you want to be perceived? Write down a few thoughts, take a look at your current messaging, and then take a look at whether there's a disconnect there. Am I conveying what, what I want? Just scan your website, pull out the top messages, and what you'll probably find is there's a lot of things that you're putting in there that sound fine, but your competitors could say them as well. Uh, in fact, then look at your competitors' leading messaging. And then what you wanna do is ask yourself, is there anything on this site, on my site, that my competitor can't say? If 95% of what you're saying is something that a competitor could say, you got caught in the trap of just market, marketing the category rather than marketing your brand. So then come up with better messaging so that it actually conveys those things that you want to, uh, you want people to think and know about you and make sure that it stands out from competitors as much as possible. Here's an example of Highlands Aerial Park. So great company, and originally they didn't have much of a brand. They just were Highlands Aerial Park, were a North Carolina zip line, and that was close to the extent of their brand. And um, uh, they were doing well, but uh, they came to us and wanted to establish a new brand, better messaging, better website. And so, 
we were able to um, talk with the owner and, and come to find out they had a clear picture of what it is that they wanted to be known for and what they were trying to accomplish. They had built this to be a place where there could be multi-generational adventure. They wanted the grandparents and the grandkids coming together and experiencing this all together as a big family. And they wanted to put things in place that would allow the grandparents to be participating without having to necessarily zip line or anything, things like that. And they built this place specifically for that. And so now the website and the brand convey that. We got rid of the, the harsher black and red that isn't a really good fit for that family friendly inviting vibe. And we are now leading with a picture that shows a multi-generational family together. We say thrilling adventures for all ages, reinforcing that concept. We've got something for everyone, even the scaredy cats, really just um, conveying that concept. And that has had a dramatic impact on their conversion rate. And it works uh, better for them as well operationally because now what people get uh, and what they thought they were going to get are more closely aligned as well. You can assess, um, would you trust that this is a great experience? So uh, do I have ratings on the site? Do customer voices come through? And are your top messages easy to scan? So um, this block doesn't have all of those aspects. One of the things that this is missing is, you know, a, a lot of people are just not going to read all of these reviews. So if they don't, if they just skim and scan like all of us do, what messages would you want them to get out of these quotes? So I would like to go in here and just bold a few of the key pieces and, and then think, okay, if I put together those four things, if people just scan these four very short things that I bolded in these quotes, do they get a fairly complete picture of the message that I want them to hear? But the star ratings are really helpful. I'm using uh, known, uh, uh, known websites that people trust, um, putting review count in there, which is another trust factor and putting in a known uh, award as well. So this is a great thing to help build trust. Would you book now? That's another thing you need to assess. And how do you make that assessment? How do any of us make this assessment? We would ask, ask questions like this. Is the cancellation policy generous? And can I find it? What's the posture of the policies on the site? I'm going to explain that in a second. And is there any reason for me to book now? Um, for a lot of companies, the answer is no. There's plenty of availability that's shown. A lot of booking engines now show real-time availability. So people can go in and see, you know what? The calendar's green. Uh, we're, we're not really sure what our plans are yet. Um, I don't see any incentives to book right now, to book online. There's no price difference. Let's just wait and we'll see what happens, right? Especially in this era of, of just, um, you know, yeah, coming off of COVID with plans changing all the time with, um, right now we're going through flight cancellations on a regular basis. Uh, it's hard to make that commitment. And so what are you doing to encourage people to make that commitment? So here's an example of a diff the difference between um, a, a, an inviting, encouraging posture of policy uh, versus something that is uh, off-putting and, and instills some kind of fear and hesitation. So this is a real policy. Uh, Maui Zipline Company uh, had this. I don't know if this is what they have today. Um, they did not bold and and put their this part in red, but I have seen companies do that. So um, this is something to be uh, cautious of. Cancellations made within 24 hours prior to tour departure will be charged full tour price. That's true. You don't have to change the policy, but you can word it in a positive way. Plans sometimes change. We get it. It happens to us too. So we're happy to provide a hassle-free 100% refund if you give us 24 hours notice. This is the same policy. One of them says, eh, you better make sure that you are really ready to commit before you commit. And the other says, don't worry, go ahead and commit right now. If, you, if something changes, it's not going to be a problem. This is going to convert a lot better than what was on the left. And then assess how easy is it to find answers. Um, for sake of time, I'm just going to cover this, um, this, this structured, uh, this writing for scannability. So you need to prioritize scannability here. So on the left, we see the original uh, page. On the right is a slightly modified version. Not, not hugely different, but important, um, some important changes here. I went with a shorter headline instead of this large headline. And then remember, people are probably zero people on, uh, who visit your website in a month are going to read this start to finish, zero. So if they only give you a few seconds of time in this section of the page, what do you want them to come away with? So write 
rewrite this and structure it for scannability. Chunk the data or chunk the, the copy a little bit better. Use bold where appropriate. Use headlines where appropriate as well. So now with very little effort, the person can, again, this, this headline on the right takes away almost nothing from the headline on the left, but takes a lot less time for the user to read. Then now I have for this whole section here, three adrenaline pumping lines, one incredible hour. I've communicated something really important to them. This tour is perfect for ages six plus. So um, th with just uh, uh, seconds of time, they have some of the key information that they need. No effort, all fun. Zip liners do not need to control their speed or stop themselves. All right, this is a differentiator from some of the competitors. So now I've been able to pull that out very easily. You can also see here that I took away the bold red, which is kind of warning. Um, and again, operations staff really loves to get this in because they don't want to deal with people com complaining about the cancellation policy and things like that. I get it, but we need to be, we need to have a um, customer friendly, encouraging, calming posture. And so in order to do that, sometimes we have to uh, pull back on some of the kind of loud, uh, uh, loud text. Lastly, let's take a look at your images and your videos. Does this look fun? Um, this is how you're going to determine whether or not you're booking, right? Does this look fun? Is it, is it better than comp competitors? So are the right emotions coming through in your images? Are you highlighting the best views? Are you actually representing the experience? Um, I've seen I've seen companies use real close-up shots of like somebody clipping something, you know, clipping their clip to the zip line line. That is part of the experience, sure, but is that really what people are looking for? I can't wait to clip my line to the, to, you know, clip my clip to the zip line. No, they want to fly. So show that emotion, show that experience, show those views. That's what they're paying for. That's when it, what's going to cause them to book. And does the photo and video quality represent the quality of the experience. I'm going to get to that in a second. Let's go back to this idea of highlighting the best views. This particular client um, has some of the best views in the Smokies for zip lining. Uh, there are a couple of zip line companies in that area that have very high elevation, just gorgeous, expansive views. There are several other zip line companies in the area that mostly zip kind of in the valleys. It's still fun. People can still zip, but a lot of the shots are just not these breathtaking views. So I don't want to use a lot of the shots like the one on the left. This is a good shot. It's got good expression, good color, good framing. Um, and it's a professional, uh, all of this is sort of the same professional photo shoot, but competitors could put this on their website and this would be a legitimate representation of the competitors. Competitors cannot put this one on their website. This shows that expansive view that almost nobody else has. I want a lot more of the photography to be focused on pictures like this. Now, back to this idea of the photo and video quality representing the quality of the experience. So on the left-hand side, we have a very low quality image, poor color. Um, it's just, it, uh, this was not a professionally taken image and you can tell the difference. The one on the right, better framing, better angle, better color. Uh, just everything's better about this. And it actually does have an impact on conversion rate. 22% uh, improvement in conversion rate with the new imagery, 107% improvement in click-through rate. So it really does make a difference. It's worth taking the time to assess your images and your video and make sure that you are putting your best foot forward and matching the quality of what you've what you've created. So now you have a starting point for uncovering opportunities on your website. Up next, we are going to continue moving from the assessment phase into the execution phase with more tips on what you need for a high converting website. I hope to see you there.